Thanks for everybody who uh, is attending today. Really excited to talk to you about the problems, but mainly let's focus on the solutions because I think we have, uh, we have some solutions that we just need to actualize and move forward with. Um, as those of you who've heard my talks before um, know, I like to do my thank yous right up front so they don't get truncated at the end. I've been at Xerces for 22 years, and it has it takes a lot of people to make Xerces run, uh, not just these webinars, but everything we do. So I, I want to make sure we thank everyone. First and foremost, um, I want to thank my family. I would not be here without them. They support me in my work. They empower me in my work, and they compel me to do this work, uh, my lovely wife and, and three kids. Um, I also want to thank all of our partners. Xerces, at its core, is a partnership organization. We cannot do our work without working with so many people uh, across the United States, North America, and the world. We work with scientists, we work with agencies, we work with thousands of farmers, companies, dozens of private foundations, and, and really tens of thousands of people who are stepping up to make a difference every day. I do want to give a special shout out to Xerces members. We have over 18,000 Xerces members, and we are member supported. Uh, if you like what you see today, please consider uh, a donation or becoming a member to the Xerces Society, because this is, this is how, how, how we're able to provide this content. I also want to thank Xerces' incredible staff. When I started 22 years ago, we had four staff people. Um, we're now right around 75 staff, um, quite, quite a difference. But these are the people that are out every day. You know, they're conservation biologists and restoration ecologists and pollinator experts, but also fundraisers and human resource experts and, and, and finance professionals, they help the nonprofit run. And, and we need all of them to, to really uh, help Xerxes be successful. So um, thank you to the staff, they're amazing. Uh, so for those of you who may not know as much about Xerxes, uh, I just wanna give you a tiny primer. Xerxes uh, is an odd name, the Xerxes Society. We're named after the first butterfly to go extinct due to humans, the Xerxes blue. Robert Michael Pyle, who founded the Xerxes Society in 1971, felt that the Xerxes name was an apt name for an organization that focused on butterflies, bees, and other animals, and are, you know, had the goal of no more extinctions. And we use a really holistic approach here at the Xerxes Society. We are a science-based organization who educates the public and provides technical assistance to make projects happen, but also uh, does advocacy and, and policy because we believe that is, is quite important. And at the core, as I mentioned, is this science. Um, I firmly believe as a scientist that I can't do my work um, and Xerxes can't do our work without understanding the animals we're working to protect and the habitat needs and the threats and and the solutions that we need to, to put forward. So we work with academic institutions, we work with uh, public agencies, we work with private landowners on applied research projects. We also crowdsource science through our community science efforts, getting the public out to help us gather really important information so that we can make decisions uh, for these animals and, and for their conservation through Bumblebee Watch, um, our new Firefly Atlas, Monarch Thanksgiving Counts, Western Milkweed Mapper and more. Um, we can get people out, um, they can experience nature and they can get us amazing information at the same time. We use this science to educate. Uh, we do outreach and education events and we've reached more than 180,000 people uh, across the world uh, in, in my tenure um, through these events. But we go deeper and we provide the technical assistance that helps projects be successful because successful projects lead to more 
successful projects. As I mentioned, we also do policy and advocacy. We feel and I feel that scientists have a place in the room when it comes to making policy decisions for these animals that, that one, we wanna protect, but two, that we know and understand uh, how to protect them. So scientists really do need to be advocates and do need to be in the room for these policy decisions. But at the end of the day, it is really about the invertebrates and their habitats. And Xerces has been really successful. And that's because of that, the staff that I've, I've really showed you that slide earlier. We've protected and restored more than 3.5 million acres for insects and improved management on tens of millions of acres more. So at the end of the day, this is really what counts. So today I'm gonna to talk about insects, of course, uh, and I'm gonna talk about nature-based climate solutions. We're gonna talk about why care about these animals, because I think that's important context, the evidence for their decline, the threats, and, and then spend most of the time on, on those solutions. So why care about bees, butterflies, freshwater mussels, spiders, all these animals that might uh, you might not notice or that most people certainly don't notice. Well, with 1.4 million species, insects and their allies represent the vast majority of described animal species on the planet. You can see here in this pictogram, you've got the giant beetle, you've got a crustacean, you've got a mollusk, you've got other invertebrate groups. Up here in the top left-hand corner, you've got a, a, a very small bear, <laughs> which denotes all of the species of mammals, you've got birds, you've got fish, um, but insects and their allies eclipse all other forms of life on earth as uh, diversity, number of species. And this incredible species diversity um, leads to invertebrates occupying a great number of niches in, in pretty much every environment. Also, insects are the heavyweights of the animal world. Um, I want to talk for a second about biomass. Biomass is the weight of living organisms, and it's, it's a really important metric. And invertebrates make up 62% of global animal biomass. Interestingly, ants alone have more biomass than all birds and mammals combined. And this is important because with that diversity, many, many different species in many different places, in many niches, and because of the abundance, which really equates from the biomass, there are a lot of insects. Individual insects don't weigh a lot, but there are so many of them that they weigh a lot. This leads to ecosystem services. You know, I think most people here that are listening to me have thought about pollination, um, Xerces has a big focus on, on protecting our pollinators, but more than 85% of flowering plants require an animal, mostly an insect, to move pollen. This pollen provides the fruit, the food, fruits and seeds that many, many animals eat. We wouldn't have our flowering prairies without our pollinators, as many, as well as many other flowering plants. And of course, this is really important to us. One in three mouthfuls of food and drink we consume comes from an insect pollinator. And these are the most delicious and nutritious foods. We'd have a very, very sparse diet with just the grains, the rice, the wheat, the corn uh, that are not insect pollinated and a few other, other, other plants as well. But beyond pollination, insects are likely just as important or are just as important. They're part of every food chain. 96% of songbirds rear their young on invertebrates. Most birds consume insects or other invertebrates at one part of their life, not just songbirds, game birds, um, uh, the list goes on. Fish are the same. Macroinvertebrates are vital for most fish species. Macroinvertebrates are simply the larger invertebrates in stream, river, and, and lake systems. Um, and even brown bears are really obligate to insects. So brown bears eat salmon. Salmon would not make it to the ocean without having abundant insects where they are born and where the small 
uh, salmon fry start to make their way down uh, all the way to the ocean. They also eat berries, which are pollinated by uh, bees. And so really these grizzly bears, these brown bears are, 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 are reliant on insects. It, it just it goes up the food chain. There are many other reasons to care about these animals. They uh, provide pest control. They help decompose over 90% of plant, animal, and, and human waste. Um, and they clean our streams and rivers. Uh, one of my staff, Emily Blevins, coined the term the Britter filters of our rivers for freshwater mussels because freshwater mussels pull in so much water um, and with it, the, uh, they clean the water and provide a great substrate for a whole lot of other invertebrates and help fish as well. So these animals are undoubtedly important. Um, this is a, 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 a metric I, I like to tell our, our, our elected officials, right? Because people are thinking about, okay, they might be important, but how are they important directly to me? Um, Mace Vaughn from Xerces and John Losey from Cornell uh, published a paper some time ago and found that the dollar value services of insects, and this is very conservative, are $70 billion a year um, uh, in the United States alone. That is helping drive the economy through pollination, through pest control, through cleaning up our waste. Um, uh, these animals are undoubtedly important. But unfortunately, they're also in decline. Uh, increasing number of studies are show that insects are declining um, really around the world. And as I mentioned, with that incredible diversity, 1.4 million species, it's very difficult to study every insect that's out there. Um, we could never study every species and understand its status and its decline. But the studies we have generally are showing the insects that are studied are declining. And we have pretty good data on a few groups of insects that can, be, um, can, that can help illustrate this decline. Pollinators have now been pretty well studied, at least in regards to insects. And study after study after study shows that the trends are down. Um, we can look at a few specific groups of pollinators to get a better picture of this. And bumblebees are a, a pretty manageable group. There are less than 60 bumblebee species in the Canada, in Canada, the US and Mexico. And the Xerces Society worked with a number of colleagues through the IUCN uh, bumblebee specialist group to do an assessment for all North American bumblebees and for bumblebees in Mesoamerica. And what we found was, was, was really disconcerting. Uh, more than a quarter of the bumblebees in North America uh, are considered at risk of extinction, either vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered. 41% uh, of bumblebees in Mesoamerica are in the same category. Colleagues that we worked with, or that we didn't work with, but colleagues uh, that we know in Europe did a similar study and found that just under a quarter of bumblebees were in the same risk categories. Not good to have an important pollinator, an important animal, um, uh, with this many of them at risk of extinction. And this is epitomized by the rusty patch bumblebee. Uh, the gray area on this map here. Uh, is the former range of the rusty patch bumblebee. And this was a relatively common bumblebee throughout its range. It was not rare, it was, it was quite common. Unfortunately, it's declined by over 90%. You can see the yellow dots with the little red in the middle of them is, is where it is now found. There may be one or two more locations that are not on this map. But this was the first bee in the continental US to be protected under the Endangered Species Act. And Xerces formally asked the US Fish and Wildlife Service to protect it, and they did in 2018. But Xerces' goal really is to uh, conserve these animals before they're at the emergency room and need to be protected under, under this law. This law is very, very helpful for the most imperiled species 
but our goal is, is to keep them uh, healthier than that. Butterflies are another group that we can look at. Um, and I'm focusing on North America here, but we have studies in other parts of the world on, on these groups uh, as well. But my focus is to look at North America. So studies in both the Eastern and Western US have shown steep declines in all families of butterflies. A study across the Western states found a 1.6 annual reduction in the number of individual butterflies, 1.6% redu uh, reduction a year. An Ohio study found total abundance was declining by 2% a year. So 2% a year means a 33% reduction uh, in butterfly abundance over the 21 years that they looked at. That is astounding, 33% reduction. I was part of a United Nations uh, uh, assessment where we pulled together lots of information and, and, and put it out there for policymakers. It's called the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. Hard to say that three times fast. But we found that potentially over 40% of invertebrate pollinator species, especially bees and butterflies, will likely be facing extinction in the coming decades. And that, 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 that's just not, not good for the planet, it's not good for us. Um, but it's not just pollinators. Studies show that abundance and biomass of aquatic insects are also declining in some places. Uh, this study in the upper Midwest showed that mayfly biomass declined by 50%. This is an animal that feeds a lot of birds and feeds a lot of fish. Tiger beetles, which are uh, uh, really incredible small animals that are predators and, and, uh, and just, uh, I don't know, I, I love tiger beetles, but a third of tiger beetle species and subspecies in the US are sufficiently rare to be considered threatened or endangered. Now, we don't have all of the information and there are some studies in certain systems um, and with certain animals that are not showing as much decline but the vast majority of studies out there are showing decline in most insect groups. And there was a very important journal, uh, uh, whole journal on, on insect decline that came out in 2001 from the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And Dave Wagner helped pull this together and wrote with colleagues, wrote the summary uh, or the introduction to this. And, and what he said, paraphrased was, or what they said, the authors said, while there is much variation across time, space and taxonomic lineage, reported rates of annual decline in abundance frequently fall around one to 2%. So one to 2% a year. So remember 2% annual decline a year or 2% decline a year is approximately 30% decline in 20 years. And this just means fewer insects to pollinate, birds and fish, uh, fewer insects for them to eat, at, as well as all those other services. So I love these animals. I'm fascinated by them. I think they're beautiful and interesting, um, and we should protect them uh, just because. But the current crisis is much larger than an individual species and really goes to losing some of these core um, ecosystem functions. So I'm going to depress you a little more. Um, before we get to solutions, because I think we all need to be on the same page. Um, so what is causing the, these declines? I, I think it's pretty evident. Unfortunately, it's us. So despite this great diversity and the different life histories and ecologies, um, we can kind of pinpoint the, the primary drivers of insect decline. And one of the most influential is habitat loss. We grow our food and we live our lives in a way that really just takes all the habitat uh, out of these systems. Um, we grow our food where we don't allow nature in at all. We've got more than 40, 000, 40 million acres of bluegrass lawns in, in the United States alone. And these are areas that animals just don't have a place, insects as well as, as other animals. Um, and this is not just terrestrial habitats. We're losing wetlands and uh, at a, it's still at an astounding rate. Um, 
this is just a, a map to really illustrate in certain places how far we've gone um, uh, down the path of, of just destroying habitat. This shows the Central Valley of California. Um, uh, this is the Bay Area, San Francisco. This is Sacramento. This is a, a you know, several hundred mile long area that really is the food basket of, of, the, of the United States and as well as the world. Um, and you can see pre-1990, we had uh, large lakes, we had wetlands and riparian areas uh, and other floodplain habitat and grassland surrounding it. You look at 1990 and almost all of that is just gone. We have wholesale removed the habitat so that we can grow our crops. Um, so we're losing habitat, but unfortunately, even areas where their habitat remains, that habitat's being degraded. It's kind of the one-two punch. These animals may lose a lot of habitat, but then they're relegated to places where the habitat is low quality um, because maybe it is, uh, there's too much mowing or too much grazing or invasive species or other issues that, uh, uh, that uh, really impact that habitat. So habitat loss and habitat degradation are, are, by, are really important. The other really key issue um, is, is pesticide use. We use more pesticides on the planet now than we ever have in history. Um, and pesticides are implicated in the decline of, of many insects as well as other invertebrates, as well as birds and, and other animals. And we use a lot of pesticides on farms and for mosquito management. Um, but we also use insects in all sorts of really interesting places that you might not think about. Um, for instance, the state and federal state and federal agencies periodically spray large amounts of insecticides in an effort to control native grasshoppers and Mormon crickets on rangelands throughout the West. In outbreak years, man, they can spray large amounts of pesticides. In 2021, um, more than a million acres were sprayed in Montana alone. And all of the insecticides used can impact not only grasshoppers, which these native grasshoppers are really important um, as part of this food web, both eating plants, turning it into energy, and then being eaten by birds and other animals. But these pesticides can affect aquatic insects. They can affect pollinators. We also use a lot of pesticides in our built spaces, um, in, in our towns and cities. And uh, the US Geological Service has shown that at times we use more pesticides per acre uh, in, in towns and cities than we do in many agricultural areas. And this is the quest for the perfect lawn and the perfect rows. Um, we need to kick our pesticide habit. Um, it's got to come along with more habitat uh, if we hope to succeed. Um, this just illustrates really where we are and the severity of these issues. We did, a, 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 did research in 2019 with the University of Nevada, Reno. We collected milkweeds from sites throughout the Central Valley of California and tested them uh, for pesticides. And milkweed is the only host plant, as I'm sure most of you know, for monarch butterflies. The sites included natural areas, organic and conventional farms, as well as, as, as urban areas. And what we found was really, I thought, startling. I knew we'd find some pesticides, but I didn't think they'd be this ubiquitous. Uh, ubiquitous. Uh, average of nine pesticides were found per plant, ranging from one to 25. 32% of samples exceeded the lethal dose for the monarch. 32%. Now, um, we found pesticides in every sample, but we do know that there are solutions to this because in natural areas and on organic farms, there were a lot less. Um, and we just need to move to, uh, to using, using less of these chemicals if we hope to recover the monarch, bees, aquatic insects, and, and everything else. There are a lot of other issues though as well. So these animals have to um, really, they are very much tested. Um, disease, we move 
ourselves and animals around the planet like we never have before. And one animal we move are, are commercial bumblebees. And as we move commercial bumblebees, they can give disease to their native relatives that uh, aren't, you know, basically these are new and novel diseases that these native bees um, uh, succumb to. Um, honeybees can also spread disease and we move honeybees around uh, as well and they can spread disease to native bees um, uh, when they're placed uh, in wild areas or, or other places. So we really need to be thoughtful about moving animals around the planet. Uh, uh, in November, we've got a webinar talking about honeybees and many of the issues Rich Hatfield uh, from Xerces staff will be giving that webinar because I know there's a lot of interest in understanding um, the importance of honeybees as, as well as the potential impacts uh, that they cause. Um, lights, our planet is lighter than ever and lights impact uh, nighttime insects, fireflies and moths. These are insects uh, uh, yeah, we see the flashing fireflies, but I think oftentimes things like moths are just forgotten. There are 10 times as many moths doing many of the same things butterflies do, but doing them at night. They're pollinating, they're food for bats and other animals, um, and they are impacted by these lights. And then climate change. This is the 10,000 pound gorilla that overlays all the other issues, and it has shown to be a major driver in decline of insects, both aquatic insects as well as terrestrial insects. So these animals are facing lots and lots of threats. And this is a, a little graphic uh, that Virginia Wagner put together um, uh, for uh, the paper uh, that was in PNAS, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And Dave Wagner coined the term death by a thousand cuts. Um, you'll see that there just are so many issues affecting insects as well as other wildlife. And when we think about solutions, we need to think that pesticides aren't just acting alone. Um, you're maybe in, living in marginalized habitat. Maybe there are nights at, lights at night that are affecting you. Um, maybe an introduced bumblebee or honeybees are uh, nearby spreading disease. Um, uh, the habitat's degraded because of invasive species. Um, and then you add pesticides on top of that. Um, these animals are facing multiple threats and our solutions have to address that. So what are the solutions? Now that you're thoroughly depressed here, um, and this can get overwhelming and it can get depressing, but the thing about it is we do have the solutions and we have the solutions really at every sector of society. We just need to implement them. So now I'm gonna talk about nature-based climate solutions and nature-based climate solutions, sometimes called natural climate solutions, involve conserving, restoring, or better managing ecosystems to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So capturing that carbon and keeping it. Um, and these nature-based climate solutions can address climate change, as I just said, by capturing carbon, but they also can address biodiversity loss. Um, so they reduce greenhouse gas emissions related to land use often by, by these maintaining, I'll talk a little bit more about how we maintain and restore these functions. They capture and store carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and they improve resilience of ecosystems. So they help plant and animals, including humans, uh, adapt to climate change. And they, they provide so many other uh, really important um, uh, services such as flood control, erosion uh, control. Um, they can provide raw materials. They can help clean water. Um, they just, the list goes on and on and on. And these can be very meaningful. Uh, study in the, another study in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences found nature-based climate solutions could contribute about 20% of the mitigation needed between now and 2050 to keep global warming below two degrees C. Now, 
this doesn't mean we're off the hook with uh, lowering our carbon outputs uh, throughout all other sectors of society. But what it does mean is that nature and focusing on nature can be about a fifth of the solution, which is very, very meaningful. And at the same time as helping us with climate change, this is core to helping us with biodiversity loss. We have twin issues going on. We've got this climate crisis and we've got a biodiversity loss crisis. And these nature-based climate solutions can help with both. So really, I think the science is clear. You know, climate change and biodiversity loss are, are really interlinked. And coupling mitigation targets and ecosystem-based approaches is essential because it's impossible to address the loss of biodiversity without addressing climate change. It's, it's, it, climate change will lead to biodiversity loss on its own, but it's equally impossible to tackle the full impacts of climate change without working to protect and enhance biodiversity. So what do we need to do? A lot of this is, is really about thinking about habitats and it's actually uh, about plants. Um, you know, Xerces focuses a lot on plants. We're a, a, an insect and invertebrate uh, organization, but we focus a lot on plants because I like to, or the way I think about it is really plants, uh, which are fundamental to the planet and insects, uh, which are in every niche and providing all of these ecosystem services or the fabric of the planet. We're ripping this fabric apart and we need to stitch it back together so that we can have functioning systems, protect biodiversity and capture carbon. So we need to focus on plants and we need to focus on climate and drought adapted native plant systems. Um, you know, drought adapted where we're seeing more droughts, but maybe in other places we're focusing on plants that can be uh, inundated uh, with periodic flooding or other issues that the climate is now throwing at us. And you know these meadow species, native meadow species, these deep rooted meadow species can be a very, very important part of the solution. Um, but diversity is vital. Diversity of plants supports a diversity of insects, which in turn supports a diversity of other wildlife. You know, this insect diversity helps maintain all these functions I talked about, pollination, pest control, food for wildlife. Um, the biodiversity buffers the impacts of climate change by providing an array of microclimates, which serve as important refuge for insects, you know, during heat waves or other extreme events. So it's this feedback loop, but we need to focus on diversity. And diversity also enhances uh, and maintains genetic variation. And genetic variation provides for further resilience, whether it's genetic variation in the plants or genetic variation in, in pollinators or other insect groups or birds that's helping them to weather uh, uh, overall climate change. Um, we also need animals to be able to move in the environment. Animals have always moved across the landscape and insects are no exception but animals are moving more as the climate changes. They're shifting ranges in some cases, and we need to provide for that. So we do need high quality habitat, travel corridors, you know, stepping stone habitats. Um, improving connectivity enables these animals to, you know, to just live, right? They, they can move among the populations. It increases gene flow. It helps prevent, uh, populations from becoming too small, but also helps them to move across in the face of climate change. And with insects, these connections don't need to be as large as for other animals. I really call it connectivity, not corridors, because insects don't really move the same way as some a mammal or another animal might be moving up and down a corridor. This is a study that we did also with the University of Nevada, Reno, that's in press right now. And I, I won't really belabor it, but this is the Central Valley that I showed you where we've lost so much habitat. And we were looking at connectivity across these landscapes, um, both habitat connectivity, connectivity and the effect of pesticides on that connectivity. And you can see this is the current situation. 
And there just aren't many connections. But what we found is if we can deal with pesticide issues and put in habitat, um, we can increase uh, connectivity a lot um, just by looking at agricultural margins in the Central Valley. This paper hopefully will be published in the, in the coming weeks or, or coming months. And Xerces is already working on these issues. We've restored over 100 miles of hedgerows in the Central Valley to date. Um, and this is, uh, you know, hard to, a little bit hard to see, maybe doesn't look like much because it was just planted, but it's a rather large planting over a mile long. This is a, a big pickup truck here uh, that will allow connectivity across these landscapes that don't have much connectivity. Um, connectivity is also important in towns and cities. Uh, Xerces has launched the Santa Fe Pollinator Trail uh, to co connect climate smart habitat across the city. Um, the white areas in this map are areas where we don't have much natural habitat. The idea is to provide habitat, work with parks, work with schools, work with individuals to strategically place pollinator habitat by providing um, a habitat free to uh, our partners who are, are, are working with us on these issues. We also have to maintain soils. Um, soil and soil biodiversity are really essential because we can't have healthy systems, whether they be farming systems or natural systems without healthy soils. Um, check out our resources on the Xerces Society website. We also do webinars on, on um, improving soil health uh, and supporting uh, soil invertebrates. So if we hope though to address, I think we, we do have the solution. We know what to do, but we have to do this at scale. Society must focus on these solutions in all landscapes, whether it be wildlands, to farmlands, to urban cores. And I like to think that the natural areas are really the glue that holds all this other habitat together. We often have refuge habitat, refuge biodiversity in our natural areas. And we can work to maximize uh, diversity of native plant resources and the insects and other invertebrates and other animals that come along with that. And we can manage these habitats in ways that um, uh, minimizes the impacts from things potentially like grazing or mowing uh, or invasive species um, and maximize the benefits to this uh, plant and insect diversity. Um, this, this, is, this can be done. Um, we also need to look at these native natural processes like fire. Um, we always have had fire in our, in our systems um, and both controlled fire uh, as well as natural fire are really vital to maintaining biodiversity. Um, prescribed fire is not only an important tool for managing vegetation, but it actually increases resilience in these systems and can protect these systems from, from having hotter fires in the future. Um, but we do need to use a little caution with some of these. Um, burning can extirpate populations, that's local extinction um, of insects, um, because they might not be able to move out of the way or they might not be able to recolonize after burning. So we do need to be out there um, putting these processes back into place where we can um, by the way, I think native communities have a really important role to play here because they've been doing this for, you know, many, many hundreds of years. But we do need to take the uh, think about the insects as as we do it. Now, logging is not a substitute for prescribed fire, um, but thinning in the right place at the right time um, can really help us sustainably manage these forests. But we need a light touch. What we see out west is after fires, um, uh, people will come in and do what's called salvage logging on sometimes on a major scale. And this salvage logging is really detrimental to forest insects, the birds they eat, uh, soil insects, things like mollusks. And, and we need a lighter touch if we're gonna be successful. And it's not just forests, right? Um, we have lots of natural areas um, that we can manage for capturing carbon and for biodiversity. And some efforts have started to plant trees 
in places where they should not be. Um, uh, I've seen projects in Europe where they're planting trees in, in native prairies or even in, uh, in peat bogs for climate, quote unquote, for climate change. That is not a good way forward. We need to manage the native systems to maximize how much carbon they can uh, catch and maximize the amount of biodiversity that, uh, that, they, um, uh, that, that, that they can provide for. Um, and Xerces does work with land managers across North America to understand how best to you know, manage things like uh, uh, cattle grazing and fire, because these are really important considerations, as I mentioned, that can, that can uh, either uh, help or, um, or cause problems, depending on, on, on how they're done. Um, but we can only do this if we, if we get rid of some of these stressors. Um, you know, I mentioned the large scale spraying for grasshoppers. We can't meet our goals if we continue to outright kill the biodiversity uh, that's out there um, by using too many pesticides over too large of an area. And we do need to think about aquatic uh, conservation. You know, these streams, rivers, wetlands are vital, and many of the invertebrate groups that use fresh water are, are imperiled. And I do want to give a shout out. Uh, this is not an invertebrate, but I want to give a shout out to beaver. Um, uh, beaver were almost trapped to extinction. Um, uh, they were gone from large areas of their former range. But where they've come back or been reintroduced, they're really showing how they can help uh, uh, basically manage these areas. I mean, that's what beetles do. They manage for wet areas and wetlands. They provide for climate resilience and they can limit wildfire, wild, wildfire spread. And, and they help the uh, invertebrates and birds and everything else that are in these systems. Um, and when we're thinking about aquatic systems, we need to think beyond fish. Um, you know, some river restoration efforts can kill thousands of freshwater mussels. We've found that in the past. And Xerces is now working with tribes, agencies, and others on restoration for all biodiversity, not just the fish. We're actually looking into climate change and uh, assessing where the best areas are for restoration of, of freshwater mussels. But we need to think about the system, not just one animal in the system when we're doing conservation. Towns and cities are also an essential piece of the puzzle. 80% of us live in towns and cities. And if you do this to your yard, um, uh, it certainly, certainly helps. Um, you know, urban meadows are, are beautiful and really valuable at capturing carbon. And we should maximize the number of urban meadows that we have. But trees are also an essential part of the solution. Trees really play an important role in moderating temperature, moisture, stormwater buffering, all sorts of other services. But we have to move <laughs> to having a diverse tree canopy because over and over and over, we keep seeing large die-offs of trees in towns and cities because we planted one type of tree um, for blocks and blocks and blocks. And we need diversity and we need to be thinking about climate change and what the climate's gonna be like in 40, 50 years when we're doing tree planting. So we're planting the right trees in the right place. And then there's uh, room for this middle ground, you know, small, medium and large shrubs um, can have a really important place in these towns and cities. Um, you know, they have more value per square meter often uh, for biodiversity and can capture more carbon if you're planting the right types of, of, of shrubs. Um, I do want to just briefly mention our Bee City USA effort. This is an initiative of the Xerces Society. Bee City and Bee Campus affiliates provide healthy habitat rich in a variety of native plants and free or nearly free of pesticides. And they're doing really astounding things. Um, since 2019, our network has completed over a thousand pollinator habitat projects. 98 cities have worked with their communities to reduce pesticide use, and they have a really broad reach. We, our, our network has reached over a million people. 
with this pollinator conservation message, which is huge because we need to really amplify uh, these, uh, these messages so we can get more and more people taking action. And, you know, I grew up the youngest of nine kids in the middle of Omaha, Nebraska, and, and my dad was great. He tried to get us out camping um, when he could, but we didn't have a huge amount of money. We didn't go to far flung places. My love of biodiversity really comes from having an area about a block and a half from my house that had no, not yet had houses on it. It's now all houses, but it had an ephemeral stream and a little meadow and a little woods. I thought this place was huge, by the way, when I was a little kid. And my mom would shoo me out the door and I'd be there all the time, you know, at night catching fireflies, in the day, you know, looking at butterflies and lifting over rocks and finding snakes and lizards. And we need to ensure that our towns and cities have places for all people to go and see wildlife. Maybe it's not seeing a wolf or an elk, but seeing a bee, seeing birds, seeing butterflies can connect you to, to nature in a, in a meaningful way. I'm not sure I would do what I do now without having that access. Now, Xerces is doing more and more work, as I said, with Bee City USA, but also with our other uh, programs, uh, trying to work more in towns and cities. We've just hired uh, staff in Detroit to focus on uh, community supported agriculture and other urban agriculture um, uh, uh, in partnership with the USDA and RCS. We're, as I showed, we're working in, in Santa Fe, we're working in Boulder, Colorado, and hopefully other front range cities, and we're hoping to work more and more in, in this uh, town and city space. Um, roadsides, though, can also be, you know, we've got uh, wild areas and cities, and what connects everything is the roadsides, right? At the same time, we're moving to electric vehicles, which we really need to do. Um, we can make our roadsides more pollinator friendly. There are 10 million acres of roadsides. And all of these roadsides can be managed for biodiversity. Um, you can have safety along the roadsides while minimizing disturbance and maximizing diversity and capturing carbon. Jennifer Hopwood, who is our roadside lead, wrote this publication as well as many others and works with DOTs across the country because um, DOTs are stepping up uh, to, to manage their roadsides in, in a much more uh, thoughtful way. Um, but agriculture is another area that we need to focus on. 40% of our land uh, is in agriculture. Fence row to fence row farming, you know, the use of pesticides and chemical fertilizer, soil degradation, all of these are impacting biodiversity, impacting insects, impacting other invertebrates, impacting birds and other animals. And we really need to shift away from the way we currently do agriculture using more ecological intensification, regenerative farming, agroecology. And it can be done, um, but it has to be a very concerted effort. Restoration is gonna be a key and vital component of protecting and recovering insects in these agricultural landscapes. I do wanna say farmers are stepping up. We have many, many, many farm partners who really want to do the right thing. And there are many agricultural nature-based climate solutions that can help biodiversity. Um, continuous vegetation cover crops, reduced tillage, you know, diversified, diversified crop rotations. These are all really important. But if we want to truly make agriculture climate smart, we need to add to cover crops and, and, and reduce tillage uh, permanent habitat. We need to focus on permanent habitat on and around the farm as part of this climate biodiversity solution. And there are lots of ways to do that. There are lots of ways within farming to add habitat, whether these are riparian buffers, you know, filter strips, insectary strips. I can't go into these all in detail, um, you know, or flowering hedgerows. You know, hedgerows uh, can be pretty important part of, of our work on farms because they fit into a linear space. Um, hedgerows can get pretty big, provide quite a lot of biodiversity support, 
um, for their unit area because of their linear nature and, and they're tall, they can also capture more carbon that way. There are also tons of other benefits that, that hedgerows can have uh, along with this biodiversity and uh, climate um, uh, mitigation effect. And, but one thing we need to think about when we're doing restoration projects is ensuring we have the right plants at the right time in the right place, right? And Xerces has incredible staff people that are developing seed mixes and uh, planting scenarios uh, and restoration plans that are adapted to these future climate scenarios, whether we're in California and seeing potentially long-term drought or other areas where we're seeing you know, more variable weather, we need to think about having the right plants at the right time in the right place. And our goal is really to go from this to this. Um, and, and these are habitats that staff have worked with farmers on across the country. And I just wanna quickly show them because farmers are stepping up and our farmer partners are really working, whether it's in berry farms or wheat farms, or prairie restoration in Iowa, um, these other systems. Uh, the, uh, this, this, this photo collage could go on and on and on, um, but, but I don't have time to do that. Um, Xerces is also working to incentivize these efforts through both the farm bill. Uh, we have farmer, uh, sorry, we have partner biologists throughout the United States that work with NRCS or embedded with NRCS and help try to get, help farmers get uh, cost share funding and, and other support through farm bill programs. We also have Be Better Certified. It's a, the first and only of its kind third party food and farm certification program. It focuses on permanent habitat, cover crops, protection from pesticides and climate adaptation. And I wanted to point out third party because if you look at organic, if, if you look at um, uh, the no GMO, uh, if you look at the other high quality certifications, they're all third party certified. We need to make sure that if companies uh, are stepping up, that they are doing the right thing and having a third party come in to ensure that is really vital as we move forward. But Be Better certification really allows for farmers to grow their crop, but provide for biodiversity, um, help with climate, and hopefully get an incentive by having the Be Better Certified seal on their product. I just wanna end with uh, pesticides because it's such an important issue. There's a lot of conservation groups, not a lot. There are some conservation groups out there that don't seem to focus on pesticides. They're just really focused on habitat and habitat's vital, as I said. But to solve the insect decline, biodiversity, and climate crisis, we have to make major strides uh, to minimize the impact of pesticides in all landscapes. It has to be part of the core solutions. So many studies show that pesticides are a real driver of insect decline, as well as decline of other animals. And they move well beyond the borders of the fields where they're put. Um, pesticides also uh, are a significant source of greenhouse gases, the way they're produced and used often. And, you know, they can sometimes have severe consequences. This is a, a bumblebee kill where over 100,000 bumblebees in 600 colonies were killed in Wilsonville, Oregon. 100,000 bumblebees. And we saw this because these were falling on uh, in mass on parking lots. And so somebody noticed it, they let us know about it, we were able to document it. But there are bee kills daily across the United States. These animals may be falling in the dozen or the hundred or the several hundred, or maybe even in the thousands, but they're falling in places where people just don't see that. They are um, being poisoned though daily because we're still using these chemicals, the same chemicals that kill these bumblebees, and we're using them across the country. Now, the chemical that killed those bumblebees was a neonicotinoid. I think people have uh, heard about neonics. They are the, some of the bad actors of, of the insecticide world, or at least some of the neonic products are. 
Um, there can be highly toxic, which makes sense for a pesticide. They're systemic, which means they get into every plant part, including pollen and nectar. Um, but the issue also is that they're incredibly persistent. They can last for years in the environment and they're highly mobile, which means they move across the landscape into uh, plantings that might be adjacent to fields uh, or into our waterways. Um, and we should uh, focus on, on some of the bad actors, but we really need to go beyond that because we, we have to move to a truly ecological-based integrated pest management approach um, if we are to protect biodiversity and help with climate change. In, in towns and cities, we really just should move away from using pesticides. We use pesticides for cosmetic reasons. They should not be used to make a plant perfect. In ag, we should be moving as much as possible to organic and truly sustainable methods. So just to very last couple slides and some final thoughts. One take home message that I hear every day from my staff and that I hear from partners uh, is that working in partnerships is key. This is a big issue. These are big, big issues. It's gonna take all hands on deck for us to make a dent in this. And coordination and communication are really keys to our success. We have to work together here. And Xerces, that's why Xerces has, has so many partnerships. Um, we also need to address, well, to fully address biodiversity and, and address the climate crisis, all people need to be actively seen and engaged as part of this solution. The conservation community, Xerces included, uh, take full responsibility for this has a lot more work to do to grow inclusivity so that BIPOC and all communities can feel welcome in our work. We also must practice reciprocity to ensure that we're showing up for our partners and expanding our partnerships equitably. Um, and everybody's got a role. You don't even need a yard. You can become a community scientist. If you have the, uh, if you're fortunate enough to be in a position to buy organic and sustainable food, please do. That is supporting the farmers who are trying to do the right thing. Take action to curb your own footprint. We all, all need to eat less meat. We all need to eliminate unneeded travel. And we need to support candidates that care about science and conservation because we can't do it alone. We need better policies uh, uh, to help curb biodiversity loss and uh, halt the climate crisis. But the good news is this stuff works. Um, you know, whether you're in a yard or farm, um, uh, these methods work. Um, these insects are resilient. And if we provide what they need, if we protect and restore habitat on farms and yards, um, that shows almost immediate return. Plant the plants and the insects will come. Um, and in turn, we'll support other wildlife, capture carbon, and it really, really will, will help all of us. So take a little action today, do something. Start a list and say, I can do this. You don't have to convert your entire yard or farm right away, but find out more, find out how you can be part of this solution because we really need all of you. And with that, just a couple things. We have a huge, number of resources. We've got our books, which you can get at any bookstore or online. And we've got a lot of free resources uh, on our website that you can download for free. If you don't see what you need, please reach out. Um, uh, if you're doing a big habitat project, please reach out and, and we can figure out whether there's a partnership that, that fits. And with that, uh, thanks so much um, for your time today. Really appreciate you taking this hour uh, to listen about uh, nature-based climate solutions. Thank you so much, Scott. We do recognize it is on the hour. So those of you who have to jump off, thank you for joining us. We have a few comments in the chat. Um, Scott, just thanking you for your presentation. And this will be um, this recording will be posted on YouTube, hopefully by this evening, if not tomorrow on our channel. And if you haven't subscribed, please do. We have a lot of great webinars on there. 
but we'll just jump right into questions. They're quite wide ranging, but luckily Scott um, is the right person to ask a lot of wide ranging questions too. <laughs> well, well, let's hope so. All right, so the first question is by Johanna. They are wondering, uh, many mosquito spraying companies claim to be non-toxic to other insects, which is not often, which is often untrue. Is there any way to hold companies accountable for false advertising? Yeah, I think the false advertising part is the difficult part, and I'm not a legal expert on advertising and false advertising, so I, I'm just not sure. But what we need to do more of, um, which is what Decatur, Georgia has done, is to start to um, advertise about how uh, mosquito spraying can be highly detrimental to biodiversity, to pollinators, to water quality. Decatur, Oregon, or Decatur, Georgia is one of our bee cities, and they've taken on an effort to educate the public um, on these mosquito spraying and mosquito spray companies and how this mosquito spraying, one, is terrible for biodiversity, but the other issue with mosquito spraying, in most cases, if you're doing it in a situation in a yard, it doesn't work. You can't manage a mosquito population that is wide ranging in a neighborhood by fogging your yard. Um, it just doesn't work. So um, that's what I think we need to do. Um, I'd love somebody to look into the false advertising claims, um, but I think in some ways the false advertising that this actually works might be as important as the false advertising that this doesn't harm biodiversity because people don't like faith for things that don't work. Um, and, and for the most part, it doesn't. So, but we need to get those messages out there more broadly that, that this is not a solution um, and it is harming our, our environment and can harm our pets and can harm our health. Thank you. A few more questions kind of in the same line of thought. Quickly, can you just explain the difference between insecticides and pesticides? Yeah, so pesticides is a really broad category. So a pesticide is any um, chemical, uh, doesn't have to be a chemical, but usually is a chemical um, that uh, kills any pest. So you have a rodenticide, it would kill rodents. You have a molluscicide, it kills mollusks. You have an herbicide, it kills plants. And then you have an insecticide and those are manufactured to kill insects. So, um, uh, you know, we do need to think about this broad uh, pesticide category too, because what we've seen is when you combine things like fungicides, so those kill fungus with insecticides that can make those insecticides uh, much more um, uh, strong. And so they kill more insects than are really even intended. Um, so it's this broad category, pesticides, and we need to be thoughtful about all pesticides, but insecticides are the ones that, that really target insects. So neonicotinoids, for instance, are insecticides. Thank you, Scott. So Doreen lives in hot and humid Houston, Texas, where mosquitoes are feared for spreading diseases like West Nile and Zika. Their Community Homeowners Association pays for mosquito spraying. They've asked to opt out and they are told it's not possible. Any advice on re-educating the HOA to stop pesticide use? Yeah, so we have some resources on our computer or on our website that you can go to um, that could provide an underpinning for this education effort um, on how to educate your community on, on mosquito management. Um, I think bringing in uh, the Center for Disease Control is, is one good option. I'm not saying bring them in physically, but the Center for Disease Control actually really has a much more thoughtful approach to mosquito management than uh, most uh, I would say probably homeowners associations or counties or, you know, county mosquito management agencies. You know, the idea is to educate the public that you need to get rid of water sources around homes because many, many of our mosquitoes are living in people's gutters or they're living in water that's found in a barrel or in a, even in a bird bath. 
um, getting rid of those water sources, um, ensuring you've got good screens, taking personal responsibility and you know long sleeves, and um, uh, really only treating mosquitoes if there really is a public health issue. And m the vast majority of mosquitoes out there uh, are not spreading disease, um, and, but at times they do. And so at times you may need to take stronger action if, uh, if you have Zika or West Nile and people are being uh, in, uh, affected. But as with the first caller or the first question, what really is happening is we've got this knee jerk reaction that it's mosquitoes, they're scary because they might have disease. So we need to do something, but often that something actually really usually isn't helping um, and uh, maybe harming and likely is biodiversity and, and potentially even human health. So I think by starting uh, by looking at our website and you could reach out to our Xerces pesticide staff to get, um, get ideas, that, that'd be what I would recommend. And thank you for thank you for trying to educate them. All right, we have a couple of people asking about the corridors and agricultural areas, such as hedgerows, and they're wondering about um, an increase in pesticide contamination and exposure, unless those farms are organic and or do not spray. Yes, yeah, so that's an important piece of the puzzle, and and um, that paper that we are publishing with the University of Nevada Reno actually looks at pesticides in thinking about where we place these, this connectivity. Um, some crops don't use as many pesticides uh, as other crops. And so placing you know, uh, field borders in certain crops may, may be a lot better than placing them in others. But we also know through our work with farmers that even farmers that use some pesticides, if we can move them to a truly more ecological approach where these habitats are protected from pesticides um, uh, and pesticides are only used as that last resort um, if the farmer's gonna see an impact to their bottom line, um, we, can, we can have habitats that are um, that are better, that are more healthy, and that are going to help biodiversity. Um, but as you saw in the other study that we did with the University of Nevada, Reno, we are seeing pesticides even in our natural areas. And that's because we're using so much of these products uh, generally throughout our agriculture. Um, so Xerces really is of the mind that we do have to be restoring habitat but we need to be thoughtful and it's really place-based about working with every individual farmer to figure out the best place and how to manage if they're not organic, how to manage um, these areas so that they're not, uh, not poisoned. The one thing we should remember too is that um, organic is, is really the, the gold star, but there are some chemicals that are organic pesticides that can affect our pollinators. So even on an organic farm, we work with those producers to make sure that they understand that even some of the things they use can be can impact pollinators and other insects as well. So regardless of the farming situation, we need to be thinking about you know ecological pest management. It's not an easy situation, and we have to really think about it in each individual case. We have to talk to the farmers, um, think about how they farm, what they do. You know, there are other practices that can potentially impact pollinators, like uh, if you've got ground nesting bees and, you know, you're tilling, um, you know, there's just all sorts of practices and we need to be holistic in, in, our, in our thought process about how farmers can improve biodiversity and, and better capture carbon. Thank you, Scott. So another question in regards to farming, um, Hillary is asking if we work with Ectasis Foundation and they're doing work with farmers by providing free testing that shows farmers how their practices affect insects, soil, and plants. They do clusters of testings on multiple farms and 
one area to show how different practices have different outcomes and therefore connects to crops and income. Yes, we know we know of them well, and we uh, we we are not partnering on that specific project, but uh, but we're well aligned um, uh, with them. Yeah, yeah, and I I like the work they do. Great. Okay, shifting a little bit, Michael is wondering about integrated pest management and that it focuses a good amount on treatment on using predatory insects to control pest species. Are there risks associated with these releases as most of the predatory insects are shipped from out of state and are not native? Or does the damage caused by pesticide use outweigh the risks? Oh, that's a great question. So first I wanna just explain a little bit about integrated pest management. So the idea of integrated pest management, the end goal is not to potentially release an insect or use a pesticide. The idea is that you better understand your farming system and that from the beginning, uh, you understand what pests might be out there um, that you might need to, to uh, do something to treat for, and uh, that you're out scouting for those pests to basically understand at what levels they might actually impact your bottom line. The difference with this and some other farming is uh, we have gone in farming to kind of prophylactic use of insecticides and other pesticides in many farming systems, which means you just apply them no matter what, and that's what seed treatments are. Um, it doesn't matter whether you're going to have pest pressure or not. You're buying a, a, a plant where its seed is coated with insecticide. So integrated pest management, you really understand the system. You're out scouting. You're using cultural practices and other methods so that you don't have to take any specific action on any one specific pest. And if a pest reaches a threshold, then you look for the least impactful solution to managing for that pest. And uh, you notice I say managing because it's not really controlling it because we'll likely never control a pest in, in some ag system. It's managing it to a level that doesn't affect your bottom line. So now we come to, should I release insects into the environment or should I use pesticides? And uh, it's a bit of a fraught decision um, uh, because the release of insects, which I didn't have time to talk about, um, has led to declines in, in some native insects that we have. Uh, a very important case is over many years, we have released two um, uh, lady beetle species, one from Asia and one from Europe multiple times into farming systems throughout the United States. And it's likely the, uh, it's the leading factor anyway in decline of one of our native ladybird beetles, um, uh, sometimes called ladybugs, because they likely outcompeted and even eat it. So we also have released parasitoid flies for things like gypsy moth, and they affect large silk moths. The, these animals, once they're out in the environment, don't necessarily um, stay where you place them. So, but it's really dependent on what, which chemical you might be using because some chemical applications um, are very short lived and might have a minimal impact. There are some uh, you know, insects that we've released over and over and over again that are now found in some of these environments that might not be, uh, have shown to be as, as impactful. So, Again, this is, this is ecology and this is conservation that oftentimes you can't have a blanket. Um, this is better than the other, but I'm glad whoever brought this up brought it up because the release of insects called classical biological control uh, really does have and can have a major long-term impact on native insects. And then I'll last say, what we try to focus on instead of classical biological control is, is, is biological control where we are building systems to attract the native insects um, that are pests, or sorry, that are predators and parasitoids of crop pests. 
The neat thing about pollinator hedgerows and other pollinator plantings is they can have multiple benefits it's called stackable benefits. And you can design them in a way that brings in a bunch of native pollinators, feeds honeybees, um, but also brings in a lot of, uh, of, of native predators and parasitoids of, of the crop pest. Uh, they also help with water quality and other things. So, um, so that's where our focus is rather than on, on release of, of exotics to control exotics because um, it can work, but we've seen, we've seen pretty major issues with it in the past. All right, thank you, Scott. Shifting here a little bit, Johanna is wondering if you have a good tool for measuring the carbon sequestration done by grasslands or other habitats beside forests. Um, there are tools out there that can help uh, do this. And we are looking, we have a project right now that's looking at how, uh, and, and how much our hedgerows and other things uh, sequester carbon. So if you look out on the web and you just Google that, you might find a tool. And if you don't, reach out to me because I've got some colleagues that can probably uh, help set you up with a, a, a tool that you might be able to, to do that. Um, we're still learning a lot about it, I will say. I don't think that any one tool right now is probably going to be perfect because we're still learning about how these different systems and how much carbon they capture. Um, but the one thing I wanted to point out is, you know, our native grasslands, quote unquote, might be capturing less carbon and holding less carbon than a forested area nearby. But there was a study that came out just the other day that actually showed that planting trees in the wrong place actually can lead to carbon uh, 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 sinks that um, because these trees don't do very well. And over time, they're not really capturing carbon. So we really do need to focus on our native systems and ensuring they're as biodiverse and as resilient as possible. And yeah, a prairie might not be capturing as much carbon as that woodland over there, but if it was a native prairie, um, we should be keeping that intact and, and it will capture carbon um, and, and is important for, for that local biodiversity. We shouldn't be planting trees in the wrong place and it's happening more and more in the, I love trees, don't get me wrong. And I think trees, especially in urban spaces and the cooling they do, um, they're very, very important, but just planting plantations of trees out um, and saying that you're helping with climate change is, is, is not always and is often not a reality. All right, we have time for one more question that just came in from Amanda. They have found some studies that have shown herbicides can cause higher mortality rates and other effects such as distributed sleep and foraging patterns in bees, Roundup and glyphosate are two chemicals they have frequently read about. Are there other chemicals they should be aware of in treating weeds? Yeah, so I think you should be aware that um, uh, herbicides can affect bees um, and that herbicides you know, can affect bees multiple ways. One, of course, broad scale herbicides can eliminate the vegetation, eliminate the flowers, that's gonna affect the bees but they also can affect bees in certain ways um, that uh, you know, may cause uh, bees to not be able to function as well. And I think the key thing though to keep in mind is the problem that we have is we often have these chemical soups out there in that we're using these herbicides and maybe we're using a fungicide and now we're gonna use this insecticide and they're all working in tandem, which can be um, uh, really uh, problematic. The other thing I want to point out, it, which I kind of pointed out in my uh, slide about neonics, we should be focusing on neonics for certain because they're a bad actor. Um, just like we, there should be some focus on glyphosate, but focusing on any one chemical allows 
um, whoever's doing this to just switch to another chemical that may be just as bad or worse. And we need to really be, as I mentioned, moving towards systems where we're just not using these chemicals at the levels we are. So um, I, there are resources out there um, on our website and other websites on herbicides. I do know that research has shown that herbicides, certain herbicides affect uh, butterflies when they're eating vegetation, um, can make them smaller. Um, but I don't know if there's a one-stop shop for that. And I'm, I, I, I just don't know or I'm not aware of, of a one-stop shop for the impacts of different herbicides on, on insects.